So hi everyone, How, welcome to Omashe, and today we have Lab Loco with us. So before we dig into all the questions, can you sort of kind of introduce yourself and like Lab Loco in general? So I'm Lor, I'm the co-founder of Lab Loco and CFS, and uh, what we do at a core, let's say we uh, basically help brands and retailers to connect and digitize their products at any level of the value chain. So from the high supply chain, uh, the let's say farm level down to the uh, collection and uh, let's say recycling and end of life process as well. And um, so how we do that is we provide the systems to connect the products with the digital care labels, which uh, basically have unique IDs and unique QR codes that are able to track each step of the journey of the products. And uh, we uh, secure that data on the blockchain so that no one can tamper that information. So it's verified and the immutable data. And uh, that means just to give you a full picture that you can track the manufacturer, that you can track uh, the brand, the retailer, the first customer, second customer, third customer, and so on, until the end of life. So, and this data, why is it important? Because then the brands and retailers can use this information to take back the products for resale, swapping, rental, and let's say the circular economy business models that uh, can really uh, help to scale in this way. My background is more, let's say, um, we met in uh, 2016 in Milan, Italy. I was a designer and best book tailor. And so my background is more artisanal, let's say, uh, in the design background. And um, yeah, we basically got together and met uh, Iliana when you were. Yeah, so um, my background was basically um, that, yeah, I was working in um, like George Armani or Etro, like luxury brands. So I was managing kind of uh, buying merchandising for Asia Pacific. So managing all you know, the stores in Asia Pacific. And so actually the time was quite interesting because it was 2012, I think it was the time when like social media and fast fashion just about also to take, take off. So basically I noticed a lot of like change uh, in terms of um, customer behavior and also like how like trends on social media can change the, the way like people shop basically. And on the other side, I was also consulting a lot of uh, independent designers. So, so from that point of view, I also see some like pain points for a lot of designers to kind of see the synergies between big brands and small brands that basically we have the same core problem is data is lake of um, like, yeah, we don't have data basically. So um, yeah, basically then 2016 when we went to Rome, we kind of also supported one uh, Roman um, tailoring brand, kind of rebrand itself. And that was the time where we kind of started to kind of test it out with a new system, new merchandising system, digitized the uh, kind of products. And then, yeah, basically that was when Blah Blah Co kind of, um, was born because we kind of started to play with the this the this concept and we think probably we can um, build a system where we can serve more people so from retailers to designer to kind of brands so yeah so that's how it started that's really interesting. So like uh, apart from that, is there any particular reason or like vision that that you started Lab Loco in general, because this is quite different from probably what you did before for both of you. Like, uh, is there any like starting point that, oh, we need to start this or like, yeah. Yeah, so basically actually um, it was quite interesting because I we, actually he came from a super manual kind of point of view, like tailoring. So no data at all. Everything was <laughs> manual, cutting, like writing. So, but he was kind of a little bit like digital himself. And from my side, I was, for example, working in Giorgio Manuel Etro. So I noticed that it's the same thing. So because basic, uh, basically luxury fashion was so manual, everything. And sometimes we need to cut the fabric and write down everything on the paper. So a lot of data was lost around. So the system were, was also so fragmented. Um, for example, in Giorgio Armani, we have tons of systems, like a lot of systems fragmentally. So from shipping, we have one system, um, buying for Asia, one system, and probably America was another system. And so CRM probably another, 
PR another. So kind of we, we notice that all these data are not connect together. So this, that was the first point. And then when we started to build Love Local and we did a lot of research. So also thanks to um, Fashion Revolution, we um, basically saw the true cost, the, um, uh, the documentary, mm -hmm. and we discovered, wow. So fashion basically is the second so-called or considered the second polluted industry in the world. So we think, yeah. Um, probably there's some link together because sustainability, if you see other industry, how we came up. So from like music industry before we used to buy a lot of CDs or so like tons of CD in the house, but then now we just stream on the um, iPhone. We don't need buy to buy any like physical products anymore or um, like media use. We used to buy a lot of paper, etc. Now we just go on Facebook or website. We just saw a lot of news. So we saw other industries started to kind of digitizing themselves and then sustainability like comes as a consequence of all this transformation. So why not fashion? So we see um, fashion around, we um, kind of think, oh, there are actually no this sort of um, platform that can support brands or, or retail or, or product creators to um, digitize their product. Basically, they're all e-commerce. So like from, um, yeah, Alibaba to Luisa Villaroma or Neta Pore, they're all like websites, like basically sell products. But then after, um, when the product is sold, basically you don't know what happened to it. So we, we kind of on, start to understand. So probably that is the problem because if we don't know where are the products go, and we cannot control all this kind of the waste. So basically, um, yeah, basically fashion waste is one of the key problems for why fashion is so polluted for now, because if we see the numbers like every year, we kind of produce 100 billion products each year. So you can imagine if the sell through is only like for each, we cannot sell everything. So probably, <laughs> 30, 50% and then all the rest, either they're going to land your dead stock or anything. So there are a lot of ways need to be kind of deal with. So yeah, this could be one of the problem that we, we see that could be having a circular kind of type of consumption can solve this um, problem basically. Wow, that's really amazing. So like you basically collect all the data from like, from, wait, is it from the, the, the making of the clothing or is it before that like sourcing of material? Well, it's actually at any level. So that's a really great question. It's, uh, mm -hmm. we call this a product centric um, commerce experience. Mm -hmm. So you're probably familiar with the customer centric approach, yeah. Alibaba yeah. and you know, Amazon uh, used very famously. And so what they do is they track the customer uh, mm -hmm. rigorously, right? They know everything about your taste, what you want, what you don't want. But yeah. the only reason for that is just to sell you more products, right? There, mm -hmm. The reason for that is not to create a sustainable ecosystem. <laughs> it's just to shove more stuff to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the thing that we do instead is by shifting the attention of tracking customer obsessively, we are obsessed with tracking the product data. So mm -hmm. that enables us to create virtuous ecosystems because now it's not the customer, your data aggregator anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the product itself. And so this means that no matter at which level of the value chain you're connecting the product, it starts aggregating data at whichever level you connect it. So if you're connecting it high in the supply chain, then you have a lot of information. That's awesome, right? You know, everything about the farm, the, the fiber, the manufacturer, everything, and the brand and the retailer. And instead, if you are tracking the product in the post-consumption phase, then you get to track who's the first customer, who's the second customer, but as a secondary data information. Right, it's not the only focus. And the reason why we track the data through the product is because then we can take back the product and keep it in the loop and avoid it being discarded. 
in a circular economy vision, landfills do not exist. Landfills mm -hmm. are replaced with supply chain recyclers and upcyclers and chemical recyclers and, and so on. So the products are always circulating and are always uh, having new life. And uh, the only way to make this at scale is to really know where the products are, where they're going and what they're made of. Because again, yeah. if you, yeah, not connecting the products in the supply chain, you're not able to verify that the fiber is what it's actually claimed to be. And so if it's not pure as it's claimed to be, then that also has problems down the line in the recycling factories, right? If it says it's 100% yeah. cotton and there's synthetic fiber mixed in secretly, it breaks the machines. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's a problem, right? So uh, the long run really is that, as uh, Eliana was saying before, by tracking these products, now these 100 uh, billion products with a B that are manufactured every year, at the moment, they're all disconnected, basically. Uh, imagine that. So. Imagine instead of having a billion products that are connected with verified provenance, it will drastically you know, transform everything, we believe. And uh, not only that, but the amount of data that you gather about the products is not only physical data, but it's also digital, uh, let's say, data in a certain sense, because then you can create digital twins of the products. Mm -hmm. So you can save time and money on sampling. You can save time and money for content creation. You know, usually you have to ship products for sampling around the world. You have to produce yeah. the samples. If you do it in, in 3D, maybe you only use one physical sample instead of five. That's a big mm -hmm. impact if you're doing billions of products. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, again, if you're working with an influencer, maybe you, uh, like the shooting we did the other day, we're gonna add some digital garments we don't have to ship them from the other part of the world and hire them and clean them and ship them back. It's all digital. So also content yeah. creation can be disrupted and so many other industries can be disrupted with the data that is connected to these assets. So that's we don't very have to, interesting. But we'll see. <laughs> that's very yeah. interesting because this is really new. I mean, this is a, really such a fresh idea and really new. And I think that's like really amazing. And like using like uh, putting like blockchain into like physical clothing, I think that is something that uh, me personally, I never heard of it. But like when you talk about it, I just think, wow, that's like really amazing that you think about this idea. But I mean, the next question is I want to what I want to ask is because you say like it started from the very beginning for like materials and stuff. And then like, I just wonder, who is the actual customers for this? Or like in some way of like, uh, in other words is who can check like all the data? Is like everyone can check it when they find the new clothes or I mean, how do we check it? Is it behind the tag or yeah? Yeah, really good question. So for the customer, it's simple. Uh, we basically create this, uh, our cu customer platform is called SPIN, S-P-I-N. Mm -hmm. And at the moment is uh, simply an O2O scan and pay system. So you can just, you know, scan the product in the store, pay for it. And that's basically when the customer interacts with the data. So we do a, a big job of packaging all this information for uh, a light user experience. But in the back end, instead, we have a platform called L Plus. So that's our enterprise software, which we offer to marketplaces, retailers, brands, so similar to a Shopify, let's say, but it's made for this purpose. And it enables whoever uses it, not only to have the digital information, but also to connect the product with these uh, physical uh, care yeah. labels, which are connected to the internet. So that's, uh, that's it. And then of course, you know, blockchain is nothing if you don't have trusted information that is inputted in the blockchain at the origin, right? So it's like, uh, you know, MP3, you know, if, if you're using Napster and it's a pirate, it's not a good thing, right? right? Instead, if you're using MP3 on Spotify and you know that the artists are verified and they're earning money, mm. it's, different. it's a different thing, but you're using the same tool, which is MP3, right? Mm. 
and uh, similar to Netflix, you know, it's one thing to have an MP4 pirate video downloaded from the dark web, and one thing is to have an MP4 running on a trusted platform that verifies the content creators. Okay. So it's not the tech itself, which is important. I think it's important the platform that then keeps this data in a secure environment. So that's really where we bring the most value is by verifying each single player in this business to consumer environment. So that's, I think, is how we make sure that it's not only traced on blockchain, but it's actually real information on that blockchain. Mm, that's very interesting. So wait, is it better to use it more on like, let's say uh, internet shopping instead of like physical shopping because you will know who the customer is or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, music in a store is still digital. It's coming from a, sh- from a, sh- from a Spotify account probably. Yeah. You, know? mm. you don't have a CD in the background, you know, it's coming from the internet. <laughs> so we're consuming digital assets in stores and bars constantly. We don't even realize it, but oh, okay. uh, you can also grab that data with a Shazam. Mm-hmm. Right. And so now you yeah. own that, you know, oh. so physical and digital are totally blended, even though we don't often see that. Mm-hmm. But- it's already it's already blended. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's really fascinating. Blow my mind in some way. Um, <laughs> so you also have this really amazing idea as uh, CFS, right? This Circular Fashion Summit. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. So um, basically, Circular Fashion Summit was born, I think, two thousand nineteen. So when we were at Station F uh, in Paris, so basically Station F was is still, I think, the, the biggest tech startup incubator in the world. And actually at the time, we're kind of talk, talk to a lot of um, organizations, try to understand like how as a startup, we can really execute sustainability, circular fashion, et cetera. And basically with a professor in, of sustainability in Paris, we're kind of having an idea because at the time there were no kind of so-called collective actions summit or anything like that, that can basically let the people understand how they can contribute to circular fashion or sustainability like uh, easily, because we have a lot of information out there. We heard a lot of talks and discussion panels, but then in the end, a lot. I think a lot of, um, people or brands themselves, they really don't know where to tackle because the this um, picture is too big. I think also the, the ecosystem the, and then the whole picture is very complex. So then we think we, we as soon as we have a kind of technology like can really calculate the impact, et cetera. So we think we can really empower this kind of activities to collect not only the industry leaders, et cetera, we can also involve like community to easily understand they can kind of recirculate products by swapping or just simply borrowing or give to another, et cetera, to prolong the life cycle. We help them to understand how much impact they can do by that. So also where we're kind of um, talk with the global fashion exchange, also they were they did a lot of swapping events but then they really didn't know how to calculate all this swapping, like what's the impact of it? They used to kind of um, did a weight on it. So understand, oh, so how much how much pounds basically they did the swap, but they didn't know how much impact they did. So that was also one of the use cases. So basically we set up three goals for the summit and this goal was also basically to support the um, United Nations SDG 2030 um, for social empowerment, uh, innovation, and also um, uh, responsible consumption. So we kind of said really clear and easy to achieve, which we call it easy to achieve goals, so then everyone can kind of um, join, join it. And the first year was quite uh, lucky we have already like big brands like Nike, IBM, and also, um, yeah, many other re- uh, fashion revolution, et cetera, join the event. And yeah, the second year, if you want to 
seven minutes is a long conversation. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I would also add to that that as you also can notice, you know, in this conversation, it's a very intricate uh, kind of concept and uh, let's say product that um, needs also the brands that onboard this new way of doing things. Uh, let's say also an, ed an educational process to understand the benefits because they're actually shifting. Not they're not just choosing a feature and using it. They have to throw away everything they were doing before and start with a brand new system, mm -hmm. which is like in the music industry, right? They're all afraid. Oh my God, now we're not going to make money anymore because everything is digital, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that this fear before COVID, you could feel it. The brands were not so open to start this new approach of doing things. But then since COVID hit, uh, everything changed. So I think that the brands are now ready to jump in this new adventure, let's say, of digitization and IoT and all this crazy uh, metaverse stuff. Uh, but not only that, uh, we've also done it ourselves. So uh, for example, we managed uh, to keep going with the summit, which had a really great start physically in Paris. And we basically managed to keep it going by bringing the entire event and the summit to virtual reality for the first time. So that was the first ever VR summit in the industry. So, uh, you know, why not? We had nothing to lose. Uh, we wanted to keep the, keep the momentum going. And, you know, it could have gone really badly, and but it, it could have gone really well, and fortunately it went really well. <laughs> But yeah, it was awesome just because no one's ever tried that technology uh, when we did it. 99% uh, of our uh, audience uh, has never tried it. So we basically brought the luxury fashion industry in VR for the first ever conference in the Paris Fashion Week agenda. And we also digitized the uh, Grand Palais, which is where Chanel does all the shows every year. So that was another historic first to create the NFT, let's say, of the Grand Palais, uh, which was actually usable in virtual reality. And um, then, yeah, many first thing, first time things happened that year in 2020. So we also managed to gather the five CEOs of the major fashion weeks to join forces for the first time ever on a single panel talk. So there was the CEO from uh, the Shanghai Fashion Week, uh, London, Paris, Milan, uh, New York, and not only to talk, but then also to uh, join forces to activate goals together. So we. For example, in 2020 launched the first ever, again, swap event in the London Fashion Week agenda. So that was another thing that never happened because uh, usually the Fashion Weeks are designed as B2B events to push more products in the system, right? Yeah. And this was going against the original business model of slowing down, opening the doors to the public and have people swap clothing for free. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Global Fashion Exchange uh, was the organizer of that using our technology. And there was also Patrick McDowell, an independent designer that used the, our technology also to launch the first collection through, swap, through swaps, basically. So that was also really interesting to see. Uh, and it was all supported by, by Zorowski. So also kind of demystifying the fact of swapping as something, let's say, traditionally not so luxury, uh, mm -hmm. bring it in a context which was totally new. So bring it in a luxury London Fashion Week event uh, supported by Swarovski was something that was very exciting to see. And then this has been kind of snowballing in many other fashion weeks around the world, helping them to become community platforms to engage with people and create impact. So they, we basically also made a, a record on how much water and CO2 was estimated to be saved at the event and so on. And so that's an example of what happens at the summit. So the speakers are not just passive speakers talking about issues, but then we proactively make things happen together, reaching the goals. And uh, the fact that we could do it in VR, I think that was the only way really to gather people uh, apart from a Zoom like this. Uh, the only other way to gather people really is through virtual reality. If you still wanna keep that kind of in-person experience and, and walk around, but yeah, there's a lot we can talk about the VR side, but, um, but yeah, yeah, we're definitely gonna keep doing it in VR because we saved, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to finish this far here that we saved uh, 10,000 kilograms of CO2 with only 300 wow. attendees. Uh, kilogram? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it 
Yeah. 10 tons, basically. So avoiding people to uh, fly to Paris just by the flights alone. And that's only 300 attendees. You know, it's not a mass market, let's say, event. It really is a boutique event where we try to gather the few hundred people that can, uh, at the end of the day, impact the many millions in the physical world through the activations of the goals. And uh, just to see the impact from that alone and the excitement of the people that uh, came to the event, like Margaret Zhang, uh, she was one of the speakers and uh, she said she really felt even more natural than a Zoom call or the global director of uh, design at North Face said it was such an incredible experience and a great weekend and so on. And they keep you know talking about it in the company still today after a year. I just uh, heard him recently. And so, yeah, this kind of excitement uh, mixed together with the fact that we don't need to fly people all around the world just to speak about things. And, um, you know, also the fact that we don't have to build the production of an event, which is also very impactful. You know, you have to buy... Uh, yeah. and plastic stuff and all that so all together just made uh, us kind of reach that aha moment that uh, we definitely want to keep that in the vr keep the thought leadership virtual and keep the actions real and physical uh, in the real world so that's that can. is really interesting um <laughs> there's two follow-up questions maybe a little bit more than two but like the first one is about the swap, like it's physical, right? Yes, absolutely. And uh, we uh, provide the digital labels that go on the garments. Yeah. So, cause like every clothing probably when they bought it or like it, it, it have different value. How do they like swap light like, from A to B with like the same value or yeah. Yeah, well, that's really between the users, right? Because if uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, an old pair of Jordans that you really were looking for, and I have, you know, um, let's say a Chanel bag, which I don't really care about because it's my grandma's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the value? Mm -hmm. It really is so personal, mm -hmm. the aspect of value of things that we don't provide a system that is hardwired in that. We provide a system that enables customers to send requests between each other and figure it out between themselves. And then they basically yeah. just accept it. And then it passes over and the blockchain token passes from mine to yours. Uh -huh. so you it's almost it. like a dating site for like yes, exactly. objects. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really interesting. So the for the fashion summit, the circular fashion summit, um, I think it's really interesting because you're using VR and at the same time you're doing like fashion shows with it too, right? It's, I'm, I'm... Well, it's possible, but we're not doing them yet. At the moment we're okay. doing, uh, yeah, we just did the first conference, the first and only last year. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen uh, much happen since uh, around in the industry. And yeah. so we showcase 10 impact designers. So ah. they have kind of um, so-called booth and they can show their video and talk to all the kind of um, guests basically who join the summit. That is really interesting. Especially when you talk about like um, digitalizing like everything, like doing like a virtual fashion or digital fashion. Uh, in the future, probably we don't really need a physical one to actually showcase thing and obviously through the summit you're doing is also digital thing so like it's 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 really amazing and it's sort of kind of like it's really uh sustainable and environmental friendly in some way so uh just wonder like who can join the event like do people really need to create their own avatars or something to join the event yeah i'm gonna expand that yeah, sure. So basically, so last year we did the event in um, All Space VR from Microsoft. And so the uh, experience is that you need a VR headset, first of all. Mm -hmm. So it's a VR exclusive uh, experience. So it's not possible to join with a mobile phone or a PC. Mm -hmm. It's uh, VR only. And uh, you basically, yes, have to create your own avatar. You have to dress your own avatar with digital clothing. 
-hmm. And then you go to the event. So you have your own virtual apartment where you get dressed. <laughs> and then you go to the event where you meet other people, you walk around, you shake hands, you wave to people far away. And if you go close to them, you, you hear them like we're talking now. And you, if you walk away from them, the audio starts decreasing as well. So it's a spatial audio visual experience. Wow. So it, and also yeah. basically change the clothes when you have like finish one panel. So we have we had um like speaker like change like yeah. everywhere. In the backstage. The, we have back a backstage, you know, there's a master stage with the backstage and the, the, the dress. And then and after that. the talk, she changed the, the clothes and then she started to kind of networking with others. Yeah. So it's very easy. Is, you know? <laughs> That's so fascinating. Almost like in real life, it's almost like a new like metaverse that just that just like what you said. Oh wow! Um, yeah. Really... So we had some speakers uh, like joining um, in Los Angeles. Because of the time difference, we have like guests in Los Angeles or California. Basically, the super early for them. So they were like on the bed and put on the headset, and they just they don't need to wake up like make makeup or anything. Do anything, or, yeah. And, get into it and yeah that's it so super easy for them wow so um before my i jump into the last question i want to ask about the vision so what's your vision for i don't know like for your companies or for like in general fashion industry well i would say that the vision has never changed from the very very start. so the very beginning of everything was how do we digitize fashion? And what are gonna be the consequences of this, right? So mm -hmm. that's, let's say our North Star is fashion digi digitization, because we know that through digitization, sustainability, circularity, and everything that comes good unravels automatically. So I would say that the hard part was, okay, we need to digitize fashion. What does that even mean, right? Mm. So I would say there has been no idea for Labaco. There's just been thousands and thousands of small layers of learnings yeah. that gradually over time have built something that is starting to be tangible uh, just mm -hmm. now. But it's definitely not one of those startup success stories that you go from zero to one in two months and you know, raise 10 million and get 100 million users. <laughs> it was uh, definitely, uh, yeah, a process and uh, an understanding of the industry, which is so different from many others, right? If you're digitizing music, you close a deal with Sony and you got half of the world's best music with one deal. Yeah. And it's there forever, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you know, do anything else. And in fashion instead, you know, it's so complex. There's so many layers and people and supply chain and content creators and magazines and everything, right? That needs the industry to be vibrant and alive. So that's what took the most, I would say, to reach the vision. Yeah, and the most tricky part is fashion is connect to culture and um, time <laughs> yes. and everything, the human. So also people, we as human, we constantly change like dress, how we dress, like from 10 years before I was like seeing my Instagram, like, oh, 10 minutes ago, I was dressing like this. <laughs> like, also fashion is changing every day and how like with technology, we can maintain this cultural art and spirit of fashion, basically, because in the end, Fashion is so beautiful for a lot of people. It's creativity. We love the beautiful things. We love creativity. We love people how interpreted this item or this product in different ways. Mm -hmm. So how we can use technology, but at the same time maintain this kind of spirit of this product or this industry, because sometimes by digitizing it, we can see a lot of gaming coming in. Probably it lost a little bit the the human part of the fashion itself. I think that's a debate and conflict that we also constantly see. We're kind of in the interesting time or turning point of the industry or also for humanity, I think, with all this 5G coming up. So yeah, I think we we have, a our generation, we have quite important kind of responsibility to kind of use technology for good and at the same time to maintain and 
reserve our beauty of culture or yeah anything like that yeah fashion industry i think to digitalize it is in some way really hard because it's a highly physical industry and it's also the necessity so like people really still need to wear the clothes to digitalize it it probably really just like what you say it's a process it's like a journey it's not really to from zero to one so i highly agree with what you're saying uh, my last question is tell me something new anything's fine <laughs> I would say I now have been living one year in Taiwan with no oh. previous planning whatsoever. Uh -huh. I took an airplane to Taipei <laughs> to stay a week and now it's been a year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I said bye to my mom. I was like, yeah, see you next week. And yeah, it's already a year. So that's been an incredible just yeah, go with the flow moment of, yeah, just beautiful freedom that this restriction of COVID has created. So it's funny because I've experienced this incredible uh, freedom out of incredibly restricting experience and kind of awful, which is COVID. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been fascinating because now I've been living a year in Asia and. The visas I didn't have to renew because the government renewed automatically for all foreigners. So I'm legally here and it's it's incredible. <laughs> wow, it that's very lucky. Your question, do you think? <laughs> no, yeah, it's everything. Yeah, everything is fine. <laughs> like live or like your business, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, that's uh yeah, I, I believe like you actually stay it's probably the first time in a long time in Taiwan for like a really long period, right? Also you, yeah. Um also me. Didn't oh you've been in Europe for a long time. Yeah, I've been yeah, it's the first time like my mom see me like, oh you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She is like, so where are you going to going back to Europe? I'm like <laughs> probably next month or no, no probably next yeah. year <laughs> that's, yeah because that, that's that's... Yeah, if you think about it we organized an event in paris from taiwan and that was unthinkable last year one year ago was unthinkable to do something like that yeah that's uh well that's a new world that we're living in yeah. yeah, the interesting thing also like within this year because I didn't tell because I thought I was going back to Europe very soon so I didn't tell anyone like um except for a few like friends etc. So a lot of people thought I was still in Europe. They were like, "What? You're not in Paris?" <laughs> I saw a lot of your events that happen in Paris. I thought you're still in Paris. So I'm totally ghost. <laughs> Yeah, no one knows that where I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's a best. Well, thank you very much for the conversation today. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. Thank you.